Um, I'd like to start the afternoon off by introducing um, Tony Finnegan. Tony has been a GP since 1982, I believe, and I just asked him whether he was still practicing, and he looked horrified because he thought, why, is there somebody fallen over somewhere? Or something? <laughs> so he is still practicing. He's not only a GP, though, he um, is involved with education of, of, of medics and medical um, students at uh, the Peninsula School. He's also um, coaches golfers, I believe, as well, and um, he's a rugby referee, so really useful skills this afternoon. So I'd like to hand you over to Tony, who's going to talk about NLP in education. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was outside because one of the things in NLP is that you make sure you're in performance day. And um, as a, I am unaccustomed to public speaking, but I also realize that I do perform, because I perform every Saturday in rugby referee. And I realize anchoring that state probably wouldn't be good for you, so number six off would not be great here. So I got into some kind of really nice state of being free and floating, which is a state, a real performance state that I've anchored previously. Um, so I don't want to worry you, Martin, but I'm feeling pretty floating and free, so I'm not quite sure the rehearsal we did last week is what you're going to get. Um, and I'd like to thank Martin for giving me the after lunch slot. Um, I phoned my wife this morning and she said, are you on this morning? And I said, no, it's um, first in the afternoon. The graveyard slot. Um, and that's a bit about my wife who's a sort of move half coffee cup empty. Uh, move away strategist and I'm a move towards strategist. So I have reframed that in that I've got a real challenge now to make sure that I do engage with you all. Um, so your first task, and I think we really need to make this interactive, is this is about N NLP and education, but it's actually NLP and learning. And my sense is that you're all today because you want to learn. So I don't, even if you are not specifically in an educational role, you can apply this whichever context you wish to in your lives. So I would like you to set at least one, if not two, learning objectives for this 30 minute slot. And if they're not met by me, that will be a drive for your questions at the end, which I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so you might just choose to write something down now. You might leave it to your memories. My sense is that by writing it down, you will commit yourself. And just notice where you are at the moment in terms of having had your lunch and just check whether we are actually engaged with the process, the educational process of learning now, because it is a challenge. And as I notice you all sitting around here, sat at tables very formally, very quietly, very English, not moving, that actually, interesting, the model that we deliver now to our students is quite different from that. Because it is quite tricky to learn in that kind of environment, which is historically, I guess, how we've all learned. And I come on to one of the real key and fundamental issues um, of being in a learning contract with somebody, which is about rapport. Um, <clears throat> I don't really view, but I, when I work with students um, or when I work with professional golfers, I do not refer to NLP. Um, I think we've, we've, we've talked about some of the jargon that goes around. And one of the dangers about NLP is that it can switch people off. So it is about communication and communication skills. And rapport is at the basis of that because I think very effective deliverers of either education or the, one of my other roles as a psychotherapist is that we make connection with people. Um, and that needs to be monitored by the moment. As you've heard from previous speakers, it is inherent that you communicate. If you are not getting effective communication, you need to change what you're doing. It is not actually the requisite of your client to do that, in this case students, you need to shift them. And one of the common terms in NLP is pacing and leading, and that's a very key skill 
and shifting uh, your clients. Um, so that's me. Um, just a bit more about my history, which is that I've been a GP since 82, involved in general practice education since 91, training GPs, uh, became Plymouth uh, course organiser, involved in, in more advanced teaching of, of regi GP registrars, then switched to Peninsula Medical School uh, in 2004. And one of my key roles there, in addition to teaching groups, um, is in the role of remediation. So we deal with failing students. And Peninsula is very exciting in being probably the first medical school in the UK uh, of having a really comprehensive remediation service so that any student who is not performing is identified through a system called the Academic Review Group and then they're brought to our attention and they have a one and a half interview with two of us. As it happens, this past year I've been working with a guy called Tony Lewis who is also a master practitioner in NLP and so they have been seriously been given a very high quality level model of NLP um, whilst not knowing it. Okay, so what do we do? Um, I'm just thinking now. Okay. Um, just one question for you all to, to also parallel process is you might also just want to choose a piece of somewhere where you've been recently. It might be in a sport. Uh, it might be a hobby. It might be in your personal work. And as we go through this, you might just want to apply whatever new learning that you have experienced recently and just look at the model that you applied to that learning and compare it with what I'm about to describe today and just notice the differences. Okay. What really comes from um, NLP is a real a sensory-based uh, system that you become really aware of your senses. And that is absolutely vital in learning. What we ask our students to do before they, they attend the interview <coughs> is the VARC questionnaire, which is easy to access online. Um, has anyone done that? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so VARC questionnaire, that measures your visual, auditory, reading and kinesthetic preferences. You can all go and do it. This is really useful in getting an idea of what their preference is. But I'd like to give a caveat now is that everybody is multisensory. And so do not get the idea that if you have someone's label you kinesthetic or visual or reading, that that is what you must do. In fact, I'm going to move on and tell you that exactly what you mustn't do. But you must pay note attention to your preference. That they do in advance of our meeting. During our meeting, we're also looking at eye movement patterns, which is another classic piece of NLP. And that has to be, again, be viewed very carefully. And I think also it's one of the reasons, here's one of the reasons why NLP gets a bad image is people go and say, oh, I know what you're thinking, and oh, you're, you're visual, oh, you're kinesthetic. And that is not the idea at all. But we do get students who are very, very preference towards one of these sensory systems. And with them, it's quite important, because quite often they're not paying attention to that in their method of learning. We also look at their language patterns. And again, what's called predicates from their language patterns, we can get some more evidential backup as to what sensory patterns they are using in their learning. So we gather that information, and then what do we do with it? Well, now we've switched our model a bit this year, um, which seems to be very effective, in that we get them into multisensory learning. And by that I mean that in terms of visual creation, we get them to start using or experiencing spider diagrams, mind maps, as per Tony Bazan, with the use of color. 
we get them to go to B&Q to buy a big roll of lining paper, which costs about £3.50, and they cut it into pieces and they start drawing big diagrams. So the idea, the old idea of you writing your small notes in lines with bullet points, this is quite different and quite creative in terms of the way they're going to start using visual representation of notes. Some of them buy whiteboards, stick up in their room and start using colours. So that's with regard to a visual part of their sensory system. With regard to auditory, um, there are great mechanisms now with iPods and the, the auditory media that are available now. Get them to record their own voice and replay that in the car because often they may hear cassettes or um, discs of information, but it is in another voice. Recording your own voice is quite a powerful media to play back to yourself to give yourself a powerful sensory learning environment. Um, the other great part about talking is this, is that you start talking to yourself. Okay, so as you notice, so if I was about this evening, if this, um, I've got a big match tomorrow, rugby match, and I'm going to just review, for me, um, uh, rock, the management of the ruck. Okay, so I start talking, but stuff. okay, what I need to do is, okay, it's a tackle, pay attention to the tackler, and I'm starting to dialogue with myself, exactly the order of events. As that, I'm creating a picture in my head of the tackler. Okay, I'm creating pictures. I might even want to draw that, or go to a reference picture of that. So I'm now integrating my auditory and visual systems. The other part to it is, and this is really quite um, certainly foreign to me, not being particularly kinesthetic, is that with that you also get into movement. And actually the, ev the evidence around is that as we visually create and we talk to ourselves and move around the room and start drawing and talking, is that we're getting into a multisensory environment of learning. And this embeds information into our neurological circuits much better. That is the evidence. Any questions about that? Okay. So, people have talked about Diltz's neurological levels today. And... Um, one of the things I just want to move on to now, which might be quite foreign to you, and you might just want to notice now for yourself, is something called learning state. Has anyone ever in their life, when learning, set their learning state? One, two, three. Okay. Learning state. And this, so this is a foreign concept to you. You can learn by accident or you can choose to learn. A lot of learning is done out of I should, I ought. So again, modal operators of necessity. People um, may choose to learn for all sorts of reasons, but if they want to learn for effectiveness, they need to be in the appropriate learning state. And this is really so easy. So they choose a performance state in which they have historically learned well or performed well. And that can be contextual within learning or it can be outside the learning context, but it is a performance state. And there's a very easy structure within NLP, which I haven't got time to describe today, in which you can effectively anchor that state. It's really important that you create the environment that encourages that state. So we get our students to run through. So tell me about how you go about learning. Well, sometimes I go to university, sometimes I go around to friends, um, I've got my room. Um, so what do you, how's your room set up? So what we want to hear is actually they set up rituals of learning. They effectively are anchoring their learning into one place. And so for all of you, and just check against the last time you learned, 
did you have a set up place for learning with all your resources? Or did it just ha happen ad hoc? You picked a book up with a television on, or you lay on your bed. How did you go about it? Because if you are not anchoring into an educational environment, your rate of learning is probably in the region of, at its best of five minutes per hour. You are wasting 55 minutes of your time. So what we want to hear is, yeah, I've got, I set my desk up. It's, um, it's by the window. I've got, actually, what I did was I made sure when I got my student flat, I got the best room. I got the room with the big window. The, that, you know, the one with, it's got a great view of the trees, so it's a really nice environment. I can look out there, feel really good about myself, get right into learning state. Um, I've got my desk there. I've got my laptop computer. I have all my other book resources there set up. I have a glass of water. I'm, I, I, you learn on your bed? No, no, I never learn on my bed. Oh, um, do your flatmates ever come in and disturb you? No, no, they never come in. That I've told them when I'm learning, I'm not to be disturbed, or I hang a do not disturb sign on the door. All right, what about your mobile phone? That's always switched off. Okay, so that sounds fantastic. So if they're not doing that, this is what we move them towards, because that anchors learning into a very powerful learning state. They are now set up to learn. If you do not do that basic, it is unlikely you will be learning efficiently. And for me, the carryover into industry, where, wherever your places of learning and change, that's how you should be setting up your environment. And it's at the base level of, of DILT's neurological levels. You must be setting up your environment to learn. I'll move on to visual squash later because I think that's, that's probably applicable later. Any questions about learning state? Yes. Okay. And your question is? Okay, fine. Okay, so the question is, where's the evidence that you're wasting all this time? <clears throat> the evidence actually depressingly comes from 1952. And it's part of a more comprehensive model. Actually, if you don't set your learning state, it could even be lower than that. Um, but the, the evidence from 1952 uh, looked at um, a variety of factors about how to learn effectively. And it had certain characteristics. The characteristics were firstly that you must be in learning state. You must be in an active state in order to learn. The second characteristic was that when you learn, you revisit previous learning. So for me, before I actually start to look at the ruck tomorrow, what do I already know about the ruck? Okay, well, I know what the ruck is in definition by law. I've got that in my head. I know recent IRB directives on the ruck, and I run through exactly what I already know. Because it's very clear the brain is about organization, and it needs organized learning. So you embed new learning on old learning. If you have fragmented learning, you cannot actually when you want to retrieve it, retrieve it easily. So you need to form conceptual learning, embed new learning on old learning. The next characteristic was that, is that you understand it. So the idea of rote learning, where you used to memorize stuff, you used to get your cards out, and go through the book, and keep going through it until you wrote learn, and then you could churn it out maybe for a history of GCSE, is not good for adult learning, or certainly for any level of high quality learning, certainly required in medicine, and, and I would su suggest virtually all university courses. And the other, other key component to this was that you only learn for 20 minutes at a time. So we're really stretching you now because Martin told me I had to do this for 30 minutes. My guess is that you're going to have switched off before then, unless I can re-engage you. 
So my guess is, am I engaged with you now? Because we've been going for how long, Martin? 15? 10, 15? Okay. 10 minutes. Okay. Well, actually, most children will have disengaged by now. So the question is, can I use techniques in order to re-engage you? If this is a topic that really engages you in the first place, that's the assumption. So it has to be interesting in the first place. So we look only, we get our students to recap, they set learning state, they revisit all learning, they set themselves maximum seven smart questions of, air, of something they want to learn about in that area, and then they purely resource those questions. Okay? And then the last key bit is that they do four revisits, that four tests of that information over a week's period. So one at the end of the learning, one at the end of the day, one inside 48 hours, and one at the end of a week. The evidence from this work done in the 1950s is that if you do four revisits, you will retain 70% of memory into long-term memory circuits, which you keep for life. So you will keep until you die or you develop dementia or brain, any brain disorder. If you